A, a spiritual life, a spiritual faith requires that you prepare yourself for spiritual scoffers. Scoffers. I don't know if you've ever ex experienced that one, being called maybe a Bible thumper or a Holy Joe, Holy Jane. Uh, someone who is scoffing and mocking you uh, for your faith. Well, Peter picks up where he left off last time saying, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. We did First Peter in the summertime. Now we're in Second Peter. He said, This is my second letter I'm writing to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Now the Apostle Paul has defined for us wholesome thinking in Philippians 4. He says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, if there's any excellent or praiseworthiness in it, think about such things. We, sometimes we just need to change the dial in our head, find a different station, and think different thoughts so that you're not going down the same trail, stuck in a rut, and winding up with the same conclusions, being down, depressed, anxious, fearful, or anything like that. You just need to think right. And that's what he said. Think about wholesome things. He says, I want you to recall the words. Now, that makes me, when it says recall the words, to me, that's, that's like a reminder that uh, we need to memorize Scripture. You can't recall it. If you haven't put it in your memory cells, you've got to focus on the word, on those, those verses, and then you'll be able to recall them at a time of need. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets, and that's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. God spoke his word through the holy prophets. He carried them along, but then there's false prophets who come along trying to distort the word. He says, but what you need to know is you need to memorize the word so that you know the word and can distinguish the phonies from the real thing. He says, uh, you got to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and commands given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, he says, if you don't, just, just count on it, scoffers will come, and they will try to uh, scoff at your faith and pull you down. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, let me just do a little survey here. How many believe we're in the last days? I mean, we got nearly everybody's hand goes up. Yeah. All right. We're, we're closer to the last days than the generation before us, obviously, right? Because we're, all right. So, hey, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. They're going to be scoffing and following their own evil desires. They're going to be making fun of us and trying to belittle us to put out our vocal witness and to change our lifestyle. And so he's concerned about in the last days they're going to come. He says these scoffers are going to be doubters. They will say, where is the coming he promised? I can remember as a child listening to the the great evangelist Jack Van Empey. Everybody, anybody here ever heard that name? Yeah. He, he, all he did was preach on prophecy. I don't think I ever heard him preach on anything other than prophecy. And uh, I remember as a child, uh, hearing him preach at my home church, he was visiting evangelists there, and, and uh, he was talking about the rapture and uh, that it could happen at any moment. And uh, every Sunday evening after church, we would stop at White Castles for dinner. Oh, I'm putting my commercial in. How many love White Castles? I love White Castle. I stopped out on my way home uh, from Ohio just last week and got White Castles uh, on Ford Road and, and, and 275, you know. And I, all the way I'm driving, I say, man, I got to stop there. But that was our every Sunday evening dinner. We would stop at White Castles. We'd go in and get a bag of them. We'd go out and sit in the car, and we'd all eat them. And my folks were talking about the rapture that could happen at any moment. And I finally chimed in. I said, what if you're not outside? <laughs> well, who's going to scrape me off the ceiling? <laughs> I mean, that's the way a little kid thinks, all right? And, 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 but there are those who are saying, listen, listen, my whole life, I've heard messages about Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back. And some people begin to scoff and they say, 
this has been told my whole life. Where is it? Where is it? Listen, this is not new. In Peter's day, they were saying, come on, where is he? Where is this coming of Christ? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes as it has since the beginning of creation. What? Everything goes as it has since the beginning of creation. That is a misrepresentation. Scoffers misrepresent the truth. Everything is not going on as it did from creation. The world has radically changed from the very beginning of creation to now. This doctrine is called uniformitarianism. It means everything goes on every day the same as it did the, the day before. And, and that's what all of our science built on. Everything is going on right now like it did in the, in the past, taking no account for any catastrophic events that altered everything. That altered everything. Listen, the scoffers forget they deliberately forget. They, they deliberately take that string off their finger and say, I don't care, I don't remember this. They deliberately forget certain things. First of all, the catastrophic event that happened at creation. They call it a big bang, but after that, everything's been uniformitarily going on as it always has. And the Bible says, no, it's not like that. When God originally created the heavens and the earth, they were without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Water covered the entire planet. Water covered the entire planet. He says, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed. God merely spoke, and the entire creation came to be. Boom. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. What he's saying is, when God created planet Earth along with the heavens and the Earth, the planet Earth was totally covered with water. And so for the Earth to actually, when by Earth he means land, it has to appear out of the water and by the water. He says here, this, th th that's what happened. When I go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered to a place. Okay, so there were, all the water was on the Earth. And then part of that water is separated from the water on the earth, and it goes above, and so now there is an expansion between the two. Genesis tells us that. There's a canopy around the globe of water, because water goes up into the sky, and there's water still on the earth. And he says here, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place above. And then he says, let the dry ground appear. Whoop. And how, all of a sudden, there it was, Boom dry ground. Let it appear. And it was so, just as God commanded it. And God called the dry ground land. Now, it's very significant that in the book of Genesis, it calls for one land, one dry ground. It was one continent. Isn't that amazing? Science is finally catching up with the Bible. They call it continental drift theory. Right there, the whole time, it said there was just one continent. And so they got a place they call uh, Laurasia, that's North America and Europe and Asia all slammed together. And, and then there's a, the, the, the Ghana, Gondwana, I always known it as Gondwana land when I read about this, but Gondwana is, is all the southern hemisphere. And, and you can almost see like a crack going down between the North America and the part of Laurasia uh, and Eurasia. And, and it goes all the way down then between South America and Africa. And the theory is that the continents are on these continental plates and something catastrophic happened that shifted all the continents. I'm not talking about hocus pocus here. There is evidence. Right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is the Atlantic Ridge. And what happens there is there are upthrusts and these upthrusts push the continental plates now, along the Pacific, along China, Japan, and all the way down, is called the Pacific Trench. And in the Pacific Trench, as it is shifted, it forces it down into this, and it melts all back down, and the continents actually shift. Scientific research shows, by doing sample cores in the, in the ocean floor, that it, this is actually true. Other evidence is where it breaks between Africa and South America, there's actually a 
geological patterns that stop on the one shore and pick up on the other shore, and, and there's so much evidence for this that uh, the scientists are finally saying, uh, guess the Bible's true. One land mass. You see, when, when the waters came up, when the, water came, when the, the land came up and the waters ran off, there is a layer of sedimentary deposits that have been called the Azoic layer. You know why it's called Azoic? A, no, like an atheist, no God. Azoic, Zoic is life. It is a sedimentary deposit layer of no life form in fossil fashion being found. Why? This happened before there was life. Layer that was laid down before life. You read a little bit further in the book of Genesis, you come to chapter 6, and it says, uh, it says here in our text, in 2 Peter uh, 3, 6, by the waters also the world that at that time was deluged and destroyed. It's talking about the Noahic flood. This was a huge catastrophe. All of Ghanawana land and all of Eurasia and all of, you know, all, all of that one land mass, it was submerged underwater. The earth catastrophically had something happen. The canopy that was above the earth fell. The fountains of the deep were broken open and the whole land mass was covered with water and it was all flooded, flooded and everybody was wiped out with the exception of Noah and his family, eight people. Eight people. We go just a little bit further into Scripture. We come to Genesis chapter 10. And in Genesis chapter... Uh, oh, well, I, I got ahead of myself. I can come back to this slide. This is why, this is why I needed these slides today. <laughs> you, you catching this? Remember when God said, hey, let the waters under the sea be gathered to one place? Ooh, that's what he says. When the dry land is going to emerge, it's to let the waters be gathered to the one place. Notice, even on the secular scientist's depiction of the way it was, there is one body of water, one body of water that goes all the way around the planet. There's no Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean. They actually have the Parthalassa Ocean. I don't know why they call it that. But there's one ocean, one land mass that appears, and it was... It was sown, and, and God called the, the dry ground land, and he gathered the waters to the place. He called them seas, seas. Now, in Genesis chapter 10, chronologically, 11 comes before 10 because in the genealogies, I know in chapter 10, it mentions 11, so it comes before 10 or in the very beginning of 10. But as you make your way down through this, this uh, story, uh, genealogy in, Je in Genesis 10. Two guys are named, and they're the sons that were born to Eber. The one's name was Peleg. Now, Peleg's name means divided. Why did he call his kid divided? Was he a schizophrenic? Double personality? Not at all. He called him that because in his time, the earth was divided. Wow. Do you ever wonder how everybody got to all the different continents? I mean, they have a lot of brain, brainy ideas, you know, that there were land bridges and all of that. It was very simple. It was one continent. After the flood and the Tower of Babel, they all scattered. And then in the days of Peleg, God did something. He divided the continents. They all shifted. That was a cataclysmic event. So things don't always go the same all the time. There are catastrophic, catalytic, cat, uh, catastrophic events. There's a fourth one that is coming, and our text mentions it. The fourth one is a destruction by fire. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. Woo! The same very word of God that spoke and brought it all to be, the very same word of God that says, send the Noahic flood, the very same word of God that says, divide the continents, the very same word of God is providentially controlling everything that's happening in the world today, and it is reserving it for the final ca catastrophic event of being destroyed by fire 
being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly men. Wow. If you jump to the end of your Bibles and you read the last couple chapters of your Bible, you know that this heaven and this earth are destroyed and dissolved, and there is a creation of a new heaven and a new earth. But we'll pick up with that next week. We'll pick up with that next week. The fourth thing I'm mentioning here, here is that, that scoffers forget. All right, but I want to move. I want to look at this verse. It's the verse that uh, we're memorizing. The Lord operates on his time schedule, not ours. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Wow. They forget. They forget that. Now, I have... Uh, I wasn't going to mention this, but I have a birthday coming this week. <laughs> and if I had been with the Lord for my years of journey on the earth, my birthday, I don't have it up there. I, had it on, I got the wrong version up there, but I actually have the exact amount of years I would be old in heaven. And it's over 250 million years old if I were in heaven with the Lord. And in heaven with the Lord, in heaven with the Lord, 250 million years are going to seem like my short lifespan. I'm leaving the, you to calculate how that all works out because uh, uh, you'll figure out exactly how old I am if I gave the exact number. You just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. But listen, what I'm trying to say is Time doesn't matter to God. You get it? You get it? He is eternal. We live in a succession of moments, right? We live in a succession of moments. I was born. I went through my childhood, teenage years, young man. I, and you go, and, you know, and now I'm an old man. And I hope to get a lot older. I, you know, uh, but... I'm in succession of moments. I can't go back and live in any of them. But Jesus said, he's living in his life as an adult male. He says, before Abraham, 2,000 years ago, I am. Oh, wait a minute. Not I was, but I am. You see, God does not exist in succession of moments like we do. He is eternal. He is the I am that I am, I was what I was, I will be what I will be, because I occupy infinity. I, I'm at the end, at the same time I'm at the beginning. You creatures, your ways are not my ways. Listen, you, you are finite. I am infinite. You're temporary. I am eternal. I will always be temporary. I had a birth date Boom, on my birth date when I was born. And then I got born again when I was eight years old. Boom, a second birth. This first birth date, I might die in my body. Oh, not yet. Put it further on the line, okay? I might die with my body, but my new birth, I continue on forever and ever and ever. And when Jesus raptures the church, my body and my spirit are rejoined, and I embody forever. I am still finite, but I am everlasting everlasting god is eternal because his everlastingness goes both ways both ways so he says here wait you think it's been a long time since jesus is coming back on his time schedule being like it's a simile thing being like he's only been gone two days folks he's only been gone two days let the scoffer scoff what do they know? What do they know? Fifth, scoffers just don't get it. If you don't have, if you, if you don't have the eternal life that Jesus gives by being born again, you've not been regenerated, you've gotten, you, you don't have the new mind where you think Christ's thoughts after him. When you read the Bible, it speaks to you, and you begin to get your head, you wrap it around it, and you understand 
The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Here's the whole point. The Lord keeps his promises. When Jesus said, let your hearts not be troubled. Since you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God is not slack in his promises. Jesus is coming back. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Why? A day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. Come on, just recall with me for a moment. Here's good old Noah. God comes to him and says, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. For those who don't know Bible terms, a big boat, a ship. You know, the size of an ocean liner. I want you to build that. And Noah says, Lord, why would I build a boat? I'm, I'm miles and miles and miles away from the lake. The ocean, actually. He said, uh, the dimensions you're giving me are bigger than I can put on the Tigris-Euphrates River. It's too big. Uh, what in the world am I going to do? And besides, Lord, a flood? What is a flood? You've got to recall at that time, it says in Genesis, there was a mist that came up from the earth and watered everything. It hadn't rained. Lord, what is this thing called rain? What is this thing called rain? Well, it's like this. You know the dew that comes up from the earth and then it condenses and it settles back down? Well, think about it in the sky. All, all that water up in the sky, it's all going to condense and fall down. And then, hey, guess what? In the oceans, there are these fountains in the deep. They're going to erupt and water is going to come up and and it's going to flood over everything. I want you to build an ark. Can you imagine what he's thinking? He starts building. You know as soon as he starts building, his neighbor comes looking, you know, kind of like uh, looking over the fence. You know, you only see his eyes, and then he starts talking to you. Hey, Noah, what are you doing over there, buddy? Uh, well, I'm building an ark. What's an ark? Well, it's a boat. Why are you building the boat? It's going to rain. What's rain? No, you're crazy. You're crazy. There he is. Simon gets his family. They're all working on it. And it's taking shape. And can you imagine? It's almost done. He said, why did you build it so big? Well, we're going to invite all the animals to come get in it. You've got to be kidding me. How are you going to invite them? How are you going to round them up? I don't know. That's the Lord's problem. He's got to round them up. I just got to build a boat. He told me to build a boat. I'm building the boat. You see what's going on here? There they are. They're scoffing, you know, and they're saying, wait a minute. Hey, Noah. You forgot to build a trailer to haul it down to the ocean. <laughs> They're scoffing, mocking them. Oh, hey, besides that, do you know how many camel you're going to have to hitch to that thing to get it there? You got the picture. They're just mocking. And, and yet, one day, it starts, boop, a drop. Hey, where did that come from? Another drop. Where did that come from? Pretty soon, it's a downpour and saying, Whoa, this is going to be great. We're going to have great harvest this year. And then it starts rising, getting a little deeper. So wait a minute. That Noah guy wasn't as crazy as I thought he was. We were the wrong. We were wrong. We were scoffing. We were belittling. We were putting him down. We were making his life miserable. And now it's up to your neck. And you say, wait a minute. We live so far from the ocean, I never learned to swim. And they all perished. The Lord keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. He is patient. With whom? With you. <laughs> He's patient with you. It took Noah 120 years to build that boat. 120 years he was scoffed. 120 years, the New Testament says, he was a preacher of righteousness. He was proclaiming, listen, you need to repent. You need to change your life. You need to leave the old path behind. You need to, you need to come to God. You need to, you need to join me in the ark. He was patient 120 years. He is patient with you too. Why is Jesus so long tarrying in his coming? He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I often imagine what it might be like. I'm sharing my faith with someone. And that person says, yes, I'll accept Jesus. And they pray the sinner's prayer. 
And that was the last one to be saved before the rapture. And then, boom! <laughs> We're out of here! We're out of here! Wouldn't that be great? I, that's like the perfect dream. We should make a movie about that. You know, the, the very last person that gets saved, and boom! You just, you're gone to be with the Lord. You see, right now, the Lord is patient with us so that the word can get out and people can get saved. But when the last person in the church age is saved, boom, we're out of here and everything changes. The tribulation period follows. All hell breaks loose on earth. God is patient, not willing that any should pay, perish. The Lord is coming, is verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now, we're going to really pick up here next week. But the whole idea of this passage is, where is his coming? And he's saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Jack, that MP preached it when I was a child, and I've heard it my whole life. And I'll tell you what, Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon on his time schedule. It's only been two days, folks. Only been two days. Listen, he goes all the way to the end. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. That's what we're going to focus on next time. I want you to take this with you today. Let them scoff. Just remain true to the word. Let them scoff like they did Noah. Just remain true to the word and live for Jesus till he comes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word and the message from Peter, the warning of false teachers, a warning of scoffers, and yet we want to be those who finish well. We want to remain true. We want to stand firm. We want to experience the end of our salvation, the glorification of our, our heart and our soul, our body, our mind, to be with Jesus. We know one day that's going to happen. And we'll look back and say, oh my goodness, the Lord was certainly patient with me. He's patient with me that I would come to know Christ. So thankful you tarried until my day of salvation. Help us, Lord, share our faith that others might receive him too. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.